Thank you very much for the overly generous introduction, Ms. Mayor, and for this rare opportunity, this honor to speak before you at the Hudson Library and Historical Society. I'm very honored to be here and to be a bit greedy, looking forward to my next opportunity to revisit, but at the risk of never being invited back, <laughs> may I start by making a weird statement and then follow up with a rather serious grammatical error. First, the strange statement. I believe sincerely that the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un, is the most famous, the most internationally recognized Korean individual outside the region in the world forever, uh, you know, in eternity perhaps. And you're thinking, those of you who are familiar with some Korean actors or athletes or BTS, <laughs> very famous Korean boy band, sold out more stadium concerts in 2019 than Taylor Swift, Madonna, U2 combined. And you're thinking those singers must be more famous. No. Kim Jong-un, I can prove it. In a Pew Research um, survey in July 2022, 90% of Americans could identify Kim Jong-un by name or face, whereas Putin, Xi Jinping, they came way below the North Korean dictator. This has implications. Our predominant view of the North Korean leader is either he is crazy, he is to be underestimated or mocked endlessly, and that has implications, policy implications. We tend to patronize North Korea. We tend to underestimate North Korea. And it's understandable why, because North Korea with its outlandish cult of personality is a most weird amalgam mix of medieval mores and buffoonish bellicosity, but they are not to be underestimated. They are very, very clever in both their controlled, calculated provocations and post-provocation peace ploys, charm offensive, diplomatic outreach. We have to take them seriously. Now, the strange grammatical error. And every time I say this, I see my British primary school grammar teacher wince in pain. But ladies and gentlemen, North Korea is uniquely unique. Unique, I'm told, is an absolute adjective and something cannot be more or less unique. But North Korea is really different. For example, North Korea is the only country in the world that while aspiring to be a communist egalitarian country has implemented a father to son succession twice to date. North Korea is the only country in the world that achieved the great economic benefit of industrialization and urbanization and eradication of adult illiteracy. Virtually everyone in North Korea can read and write, yet suffered a famine, a devastating famine in the mid to late 1990s. This is truly unique. It's unprecedented in world history. Never in history has an industrialized, literate nation undergone a famine in peacetime, not in war or emerging from a devastating war. This is a man-made situation, and over the past three decades, since the end of the Great Famine around 1999, North Korea has, without fail, every year been listed in the world's top five most serious food insecure nations in various United Nations surveys. And if you look at, there is no such list of the worst 10 or 20, but it's easy to put one together if you look at UN reports. And the most recent one puts North Korea at number three in the world with 46% of the population in a chronic state of undernourishment, hungry, not just for a day or two, but throughout the year. And number one this year is Madagascar with 51% of the population. Somalia and Central African Republic are number two with 49%. Haiti usually is in the top five, Afghanistan, um, Niger, and so on. 
What, stand, what really stands out is North Korea is the only country in the top 10, top 20, top 30 list of the most hungry nations of the world which is literate. I assume most of you have not met an illiterate person, meaning by convention, somebody over the age of 16 who cannot write, who cannot read their own name. An enumerate person who cannot count from one to 10. It's hard to find someone who is so um, disadvantaged in the United States or, on, or in advanced democracies, but there are many around the world today, refugees in the United States from Afghanistan. Afghanistan has one of the world's highest rate of adult illiteracy at about 60%. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, you have 80%, sometimes 90% among the female population, and that is a tremendous economic disadvantage. North Korea is not like that. North Korea eradicated adult illiteracy before South Korea did. North Korea did it in the 70s. North Korea was richer than South Korea until the early 1970s, and then in the post-Cold War era, North Korea took a giant great leap backward. And ever since again, has been one of the hungriest nations in the world. Now, some people say the hunger is due to US sanctions, UN sanctions, climate change, and so on. Well, the facts are US sanctions against North Korea were very weak. No trade, that's about it. Based on the 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act, the US did not import hardly anything from North Korea, but that's it. And it's the same with Cuba until recently. No problem for North Korea or Cuba because they have trading partners in Europe and you know, all across the world. Um, US sanctions became tougher against North Korea only as of 2016 when President Obama signed into law the very first ever US sanctions law on North Korea. 2016, the famine started in 1995. There were no UN sanctions on North Korea until North Korea's first ever nuclear test in October 2006. 2006, that is some 10 years after the onset of the famine in 1995. And climate change, by what marvel of what miracle does climate change every year without fail stop right at the border with China and South Korea <coughs> where in China and South Korea, hardly anyone goes to bed hungry. This chronic hunger situation in North Korea is a man-made, man-sustained crisis. Says who besides me? Well, the United Nations. The UN came out with a monumental 373-page long human rights report on North Korea in February 2014, now almost a decade ago. And in that monumental legal report, the UN made the serious allegation that the North Korean regime is guilty at the highest level of state of the policy of deliberate mass starvation. That phrase, deliberate mass starvation, um, shows up in over a dozen pages throughout the report. Elsewhere it says, the report says, the regime is guilty of, quote, knowingly causing prolonged starvation. Knowingly causing prolonged starvation. It's hard to fathom, hard to imagine why a regime would intentionally starve a big segment of its own population. There's an element of perversity, arguably even evil, in this deliberate policy of mass starvation. So North Korea arguably is uniquely cruel. Well, that UN report does say that the nature, scale, and gravity of North Korea's crimes against humanity reveal a state that has no parallel in the contemporary world. That's a verbatim quote. No parallel in the contemporary world. This is the kind of unique regime that we are dealing with, which is a totalitarian, extremely oppressive government dominated by men and from this macabre landscape in recent years, we've seen the emergence for the first time 
of a very powerful, preeminent female figure, the sister of the current dictator, Kim Jong-un. Kim Yo-jong, the sister, is a unique phenomenon. She is the world's first female nuclear despotist. I looked up that word in the dictionary. It's a real word, despotist. She has made um, threats of preemptive nuclear strike against South Korea several times over the past couple of years in formal written statements. She has said basically that she too has her finger, the provo proverbial finger on the nuclear button with the authority given to her by her brother, the party, and the state. Kim Yo-jong made her splashy international debut in 2018 when she visited South Korea for the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics on February 9th, 2018. All she did over the next 72 hours, or not even, two nights, three days or so, was to show up, smile a little, scowl a little. She never made a statement to the public or to the press. She just shook hands and then grimaced here and there. Yet the entire South Korean nation seemed to fall in love with her because she was such a rarity, such an oddity, such a mysterious princess from this mysterious land called North Korea. We wanted, it seemed, the people wanted to read into her presence in South Korea optimistic prognostications of peace, genuine rapprochement, reconciliation, denuclearization, and all those good things. And she played that role, the role of the good cop to her brother's bad cop. And this is after two years of relentless provocations, nuclear tests, inter intercontinental ballistic missile tests, three in 2017 alone, with barbs, with threats, going back and forth between President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and his regime, said President Trump in September 2017 at the United Nations. And two days later, Kim Jong-un issued a statement saying that the old deranged American daughtered, D-O-T-A-R-D, we all had to look up that word in the dictionary, it's not in use anymore, archaic word for meaning you know, senile, um, that the American deranged daughter, I will envelop him, envelop him with a ring of fire, said Kim Jong-un. After all that crisis situation, North Korea changed its tune dramatically from molto agitato to placido to a very pleasant melody and said, let's talk. And the whole world wanted to believe in their Rambo 4 kind of you know, peace offensive. By then, this was like Rambo 4. The first Rambo movie was very good, First Blood, but by Rambo 4, you have a pretty good idea how this movie ends. <laughs> so the coming out in 2018, calling for talks with President Trump, meeting with Xi Jinping of China, Moon Jae-in, President Moon of South Korea, repeatedly, it was all scripted. For the first six years upon inheriting power, Kim Jong-un, who assumed the throne when his father died in December 2011, Kim Jong-un never met with a single world leader. He never traveled abroad. He issued threats you know, frequently, acted like a crazy dictator, met with only Dennis Rodman, the former great NBA basketball <laughs> star, several times, partied with him, but you know, did not meet with a single world leader. And then he popped up in Beijing in March 2018. Why? Because he had an important inter-Korean summit coming up in um, April and also by then had arranged for the first ever summit meeting between a North Korean leader and the President of the United States and so on. And through these meetings, Kim Jong-un came across as a reasonable chap. A dictator, yes, but someone who's not crazy, who's quite reasonable, with whom we can do business. Where did I see this script before? Well, with the father. Kim Jong-il, who inherited power when his own father, Kim Il-sung, the state founder, died in 1994. For the next six years, Kim Jong-il launched several lethal, small-scale but lethal attacks on South Korea, shot a missile over Japan for the first time on Sunday, August 31st, 1998. Why do I mention the day of the week? Because like terrorists, North Korea likes to strike on a holiday or a Sunday 
so as to capture the global headlines and to be in the news with gruesome scenes of destruction and death played throughout the day. I'm not saying terrorists always strike early in the morning, but often they do. It's all calculated. And then, six years later, Kim Jong-il showed up in Beijing in May 2000. Why? Because he had a very important, the first ever inter-Korean summit the next month in June. We later learned that the South Korean administration had wired secretly, illegally, almost $500 million in cash for the price, the admission fee of a summit meeting with a North Korean dictator. And then a man called Vladimir Putin visited Kim Jong-il in July 2000, the first ever visit by a top Russian or former Soviet leader, and I expect Putin to visit again in the coming weeks and months, sometime this year. Uh, and then Kim Jong-il sent the first ever special envoy to President Bill Clinton and invited Clinton to visit him in North Korea. And just 12 days later, this is in October, October 10th, 2000, and 12 days later, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was in Pyongyang trying to ascertain the feasibility of the president's visit, and she, upon return home, advised the president, yes, let's do this. The only reason that visit by Clinton didn't take place was because of the November 7th, 2000 election and the Florida vote recount between Al Gore and George W. Bush, which was not resolved until mid-December, and by then, with a the holiday uh, coming up, time simply ran out. But Kim Jong-il, undeterred, in January 2001, visited China, uh, not n notably the special economic zone uh, cities like um, uh, Guang Guangdong, Guangzhou, Zhuhai, Shenzhen, Shanghai, uh, visited Huawei, came across as a reform-minded person. So this image makeover, we've seen this before, and I can give you more examples for the, for, for the sake of time. Uh, let me move on. What I'm trying to say here is North Korea is very calculating. They don't just simply go berserk, provoking endlessly. They know when to climb down the ladder of escalation. There will come a time when North Korea sings a happy melody and says, let's talk. And Kim Yo-jong, the sister, will be the face of that next North Korean diplomatic outreach. And there are some risks. She is a young woman. She's only 36. She is photogenic. She can be quite graceful. She's pretty. She's smart. And because of, if I may say so, the pervasive tendency on the part of many men, not all of course, but men, and may I even suggest some women, to underestimate young, ambitious, smart women, to think, to presume that I will have sway over this young woman because I'm intelligent, charismatic. If she is agreeable, if she agrees to my suggestions, it must be because she's charmed by my own you know, intelligence and charisma and all those good things. The tendency to patronize young women is a fallacy, is a dangerous trap. We will want to believe her because she is a powerful, young, smart lady. This is not in our interest. She, we have to look at her and see who she is. A co-crime boss, the number two person in, again, arguably the world's most oppressive, cruel nation. She is a weapon, an unprecedented weapon in North Korea's diplomatic toolkit. She is not to be underestimated. I first became interested in her, not knowing who she was at the time, at Kim Jong-il's wake. The father died in mid-December 2011, and North Korea showcased his corpse in a glass coffin on very elaborate grand bed of flowers for several days. And in North Korea, in Korean culture, including South Korea, uh, the proper funerary, funerary rite behavior is to mourn um, very vigorously. That is to be almost delirious and show your pain and anger and sorrow at the passing of um, your loved one. So North Koreans were hysterical, uh, crying out loud, 
And there are minders, of course. There are people watching you. So it's sort of like a competition. Uh, the proper way is to really wail very hard. But there stood a young woman in the traditional Korean funerary um, dress, black with white stripes along the neckline, standing right behind Kim Jong-un, who by then was a known entity. And she looked profoundly dejected, her head tilted like this, in profound sorrow, heaving, without a care who was watching her, whether the cameras were trained on her. She looked as if she were in pain, and her cheeks were hollow, sunken, as if she had not eaten anything in days. And I looked at that image and thought she must be the daughter of the deceased North Korean leader. And again, when she made her very um, splashy debut in 2018, I was taken aback by her aplomb, her calm demeanor. When she first made her stage entrance, if you will, at the VIP lounge at the major international airport in South Korea, she walked in and she fixed her gaze on only two or three spots across the room with cameras whirring, erect carriage, chin up, not showing any excitement, as if she's very happy to be there, not looking around with a smile, but as, as if she had entered her own living room. She was imperious. And that kind of confidence, projection of arrogance, imperiousness comes from royal training, of course. And in the evening at the VIP box during the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics, I thought the seating arrangement very strange because she and her 90-year-old um, colleague were seated first, and then the host nation's president, President Moon of South Korea, entered with uh, his wife, the first lady, but they were seated below the North Koreans. So the optics were strange. One of the South Korean president looking up at Kim Yo-jong extending his arm, and both smiled. She smiled, you know, pleasantly. But she did not extend both arms. And in Korean culture, the proper show of respect is to, you know, shake hands with, like, both arms extended. She just extended her arm, not like this, maintained her erect carriage. Her elbow, right elbow, was right by her side, only like this, while the Korean president was like this. And then throughout the opening ceremony from certain angles, it seemed that she was hovering right above the head of the US delegation, Vice President Mike Pence. She was not literally right behind him, but two seats removed. But from certain angles, she looked like she was right there above his head. And she maintained that Mona Lisa smirk smile throughout uh, the ceremony. And I thought this very weird. So I poked around a bit. And I learned from Fred Warmbier, who is one of the bravest persons I've ever met, the father of Otto Warmbier, who was a University of Virginia student who visited North Korea and then was tortured and killed. And Fred and Cindy, the parents, are residents of Cincinnati. Um, Fred was on the official US delegation invited by Vice President Mike Pence. And Fred told me that Kim Yo-jong, the North Korean princess, had insisted that she be seated above Vice President Mike Pence, otherwise she's flying back. And the South Koreans were so intent on peace and reconciliation, they made this strange accommodation. In her written statement, well, Kim Yo-jong to date has issued over 40 written statements, and the very first came in March, March 3rd, 2020, and this is no coincidence in my estimation, that is early in the COVID era. Why? Because in North Korea, there has never been a protest worthy of the name. There has never been like hundreds of people protesting against the government. There is no freedom of assembly, religion, speech, you know, thought, information. It's the most totalitarian state in world history 
Historians on both on the left and the right basically agree. It's the most perfected, advanced totalitarian state in world history. So in a country like that, there's really no internal risk challenge to the supreme leader. And despite North Korea frequently uh, playing up this fear, paranoia of an imminent US attack, since the Korean War armistice of 1953, there has never been a preemptive US attack. There has never even been a military retaliation for North Korea killing Americans. Shooting down a US spy plane, for example, on Kim Il-sung's 57th birthday, April 15, 1969, in broad daylight in international airspace and killing all 31 US servicemen on board early in the Nixon administration, there was absolutely no penalty meted out whatsoever for fear of escalation, especially with the war in Vietnam having become a political risk liability. North Korea knows when to hit strike hard, when the US seems weak or distracted. The first nuclear test took place in 2006 when the George W. Bush administration was grappling with the unpopular war in Iraq. They're not crazy, they don't, they don't just lash out. They're very calculating. So there has never been a real threat of US preemptive invasion or strike on North Korea. The point that I'm trying to make here is COVID was the very first existential threat for the North Korean leader. Because we know that COVID can kill both princes and paupers alike. Of course, people with wealth, power, have greater access to information, to healthcare, but we've seen celebrities, even heads of state, succumb to COVID. So what did Kim Jong-un do? He rapidly elevated his dear sister, just in case he becomes incapacitated. And Kim Yo-jong in rapid succession has told the world throughout 2020 in seven different statements that her power is derived from her brother, the party, and the state. In a statement issued on June 13th, 2020, she said, this useless, quote, useless North-South joint liaison building, a four-story building built by and maintained entirely with South Korean taxpayer money, she said, will be gone. And three days later, it was demolished around 3 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon. And North Korea uncharacteristically showed that video footage right away. They usually wait a day uh, to air what's happened. And of course, the, the image was arresting. It's almost as if you could hear, well, you could actually hear the detonation, almost as if you could smell uh, the plumes of smoke going up. It was theatrical. In that same statement of June 13, 2020, Kim Yo-jong said, I will unleash our forces, troops, in the border region, thus threatening South Korea. And then 12 days later, Kim Jong-un said, for now, we will suspend that plan, thus coming across as the more reasonable, restrained leader. So there's been a, s a very clever role reversal. Kim Jong-un is still the bad cop, but his sister has transformed herself from being a good cop to the even worse cop. It's very clever. Therefore, when she assumes a pleasant role and launches her nation's charm offensive, it will be even more enticing. We will want to believe in her good faith even more, ironically. Watch out. In another statement earlier in the month, June 4th, around 6.14 a.m., she issued a statement to South Korea calling on South Korea to pass a law that criminalizes sending leaflets across the border into North Korea. Leaflets slamming, criticizing the Kim regime. Understandably, they don't like it. But, you know, it's freedom of speech, information. It's enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights the right to receive, share, impart information, regardless of borders, regardless of the medium. What South Korea did was astonishing at the time. Four hours later, the chief spokesperson of the Ministry of Unification that handles inter-Korean relations called for an un unscheduled press conference and said, we will start working on such legislation. 
And then the president's office, even the defense ministry chimed in, yes, we need to do this, and the law was passed. It criminalizes sending not only anti-North Korea leaflets, but anything under the sun with the minimum monetary value, like a tube of toothpaste, a pair of socks, a bar of soap that s human rights activists send into North Korea via balloons, because such basic amenities are in critical short supply in North Korea. My point here is, had this summons, demand, request, to pass such a law, to criminalize sending information into North Korea, come from Kim Jong-un, I'm not sure that South Korea would have acted with such alacrity, with such docile eagerness. But it came from a young woman. Maybe it was easier to stomach. And again, in the intervening years over the past, well, almost four years now, she has issued a lot of invective. Kim Yo-jong has called the then South Korean President Moon, who was very kind to her when she visited in 2018, all kinds of nasty names, scared dog, mentally deranged, revolting to look at, um, crazy, American flunky, parrot raised in America, boiled cow head, and so on. But here's the thing. Had such insult come from her brother, less photogenic, more surly looking brother, maybe there would have been more umbrage. But the president didn't say a word about Kim Yo-jong's dozens of such attacks on him. She's called President Biden deranged old fool. She's called the current South Korean president all kinds of nasty names too. But maybe when she puts on her nice smile and says, let's talk, we might want to forget, forgive her rudeness, and again, want to believe in her happier message. There's a trap, again. See her for who she is, a despotist, the number two official of the world's most tyrannical regime. She is not to be underestimated. Thank you, if you have questions or comments, please, I will try to address them. Yes, the question is, what is the role, the influence of the North Korean military? Um, we, again, think North Korea is a joke, many of us, but North Korea is no joke. It has one of the world's biggest standing armies. For a nation of 25 million people, North Korea maintains a hyperinflated army of 1.2 million men, which is, in absolute terms is the world's third or fourth largest. They have nuclear weapons. They have all kinds of ballistic missiles, chemical weapons. Um, the military is controlled by the party, and Kim Il-sung, the state founder, learned this from Chairman Mao of China. The party must control the military. All personnel decisions, promotions, demotions, uh, purges of the top brass are handled by the party, not within the military itself. So for now, um, over the past seven decades, the North Korean military has been fully under the control of civilians in the party. Yes, sir. Yeah, Kim Jong-un and she, this year, you know, over the past two weeks or so, have issued statements calling for the total destruction and then the incorporation of South Korean territory, saying that we are no longer interested in peaceful reunification. And to show that they mean it, they detonated this huge sculpture, a sculpture, uh, a symbol of inter-Korean unification, reconciliation. It's a psychological game. They're very good at playing this psychological warfare. Uh, every North Korean statement maneuver, in part, is part of their grand psychological manipulative game. And with respect to reunification, taking over the South for the North Korean regime, I think it's not just an outrageous dream, but a non-negotiable proposition. 
They say so all the time, but I believe them. Why? Because nowhere else in the world do you see such a huge income disparity between two neighboring states. South Korea is 50 times, conservatively speaking, richer than North Korea. You don't see that anywhere else in the world. South Korea is a pleasant, happy, rich democracy, a magnet for the people of North Korea. Over 34,000 North Koreans have taken the great risk of escaping their oppressive nation and have resettled in the South. So the sheer existence of a prosperous, of a pleasant Korean state across the border is a long-term threat to the dictator of this oppressive, failed Korean state. When I was in college, um, my roommate one day, Victor, said, hey, let's go to a, a buffet, all-you-can-eat place. Let's pig out and then go bar hopping. And I, as someone not entirely um, opposed to that kind of sybaritic lifestyle, <laughs> nonetheless, just to be mean, said, hey, Victor, is that really necessary? And my friend turned sour and he said, are you really necessary? Ever since I've been grappling with that question, am I really necessary in this world? Well, if you were to ask that impolite question to the North Korean dictator, are you really necessary? There is a very legitimate, very successful Korean state. You're just a dictator, a cruel dictator of this failed state. Why are you really necessary? So for the Kim regime, taking over the South is not just an ambitious dream, but a must. And for North Korea to say, we are not interested in peaceful unification, puts added pressure on South Korea. It is a part of this manipulative psychological game that we are going to hurt you. You better obey. And although North Korea may not strike first anytime soon, when the time comes for a peace, you know, a charm offensive, South Koreans, Americans will remember the tense moments of the past, the conflict, the dangers of war, and will be prone to giving more concessions to North Korea. Over the past 30 years of nuclear diplomacy, for North Korea's repeated false pledges of denuclearization, we have given North Korea over $20 billion worth of aid, much of that in cash. What have we received? A nuclear North Korea. Again, on the scorecard, they've won basically every round. They are not to be underestimated. Ma'am, you had a question? So North Korea, again, is a population of about 25 million. And with basic statistics, we don't really know the exact figures because North Korea is unique in the world that it does not publish basic facts uh, like population, mortality rate. And on two occasions, they've published population statistics, but they're all falsi falsified because North Korea claims that the infant um, low birth weight uh, births, low birth weight I think by definition means under two kilograms at birth. Um, their figures are better than those in Singapore, in Sweden, in the United States. So if that were true, they would have to send food aid to us. So it's falsified. So it's about 25 million. Uh, we know that North Korea is a shrinking population like virtually every other nation in the region. South Korea has the world's lowest birth rate 0.7, which is way under population replacement figure of 2.1. So it's a long-term problem. But during the famine, somewhere close to 10% of the population died of starvation. And Kim Jong-il prevented the delivery of food aid to the northeastern region. Why? Because in North Korea, every newborn is thrust into a political class. It's hereditary the lowest class. You have the top class called the loyal class and then the middle class called the wavering class. Maybe they're to be trusted, maybe they're not. And then you have so-called the hostile class and these have implications throughout your life. All the momentous, important decisions in life are made for you. Where you live, what profession you take up, what school you go to. And in the northeastern region, you have primarily people, a population of the lowest class, and they were expendable to Kim Jong-il. So, Two million people may have died during the famine in a nation of back then about 22 million. Does it really matter, the low birth weight and the shrinking population, as long as they can maintain this grossly 
uh, outsized army of over 1.2 million men? I'm not so sure. But it is a long-term challenge for South Korea because South Korea is such a rapidly shrinking population. Uh, there are more people over the age of 70 than under 70 in South Korea today. So this is a long-term trend that does not favor South Korea. It's a serious problem for the South. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I think there is a reason if you want to have greater levels of culture and no water. Yes. What I'm curious about in terms of food people is I wonder what the key is right now to get there. Because, you know, so you have this hunger pain. So I think people got to try. Yes. So I don't think so. Um, I've watched with slight exaggeration maybe 500 hours of North Korean video footage. And um, there the body language between Kim Jong-un and his sister at public events like summit meetings, they often steal a glimpse of each other and smile. They're in constant communication. There's genuine brotherly, sisterly love, trust, affection, I think. And he lets her get away with things that are a taboo. She men you mentioned that the uncle was killed back in 2013. One of the formal charges made against the uncle, who had grown a bit arrogant, was, quote, I'm not making this up, half-heartedly clapping after Kim Jong-un's speech, half-heartedly clapping. Well, I look at Kim Yo-jong after her brother's speech, sh while everyone else is clapping hysterically, Wah! as if at a football game, I don't know. There she is. Sometimes she doesn't clap at all. Oh She's the only one in the room. She can get away with that. So I think she has her brother's full trust for now. With respect to the documentary, which is on the short list of best documentary for the Academy Awards, Beyond Utopia, it's a riveting story of two different North Korean families escape through the jungles of Southeast Asia. Um, deprivation of food and water, I mean, to us, it makes no sense. How can that be, we might think? intentional, deliberate starvation of the population. But I think there's some utility to a regime like North Korea in making the population even more dependent on the state so that the tiny morsel of food that you are rationed from time to time, one grows grateful, one grows ever more dependent on the regime. It's a very sinister interpretation, but I don't see any other alternative explanation for the state's deliberate policy of keeping about 50% of the population in a constant state of hunger.